From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father John Tregilio. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, welcome again to Open Line Monday here on EWTN Radio, the program to get those questions of yours answered. And if it's apologetics you're wanting to know about, well, we've got the guy for you. It's our own Father John Tregilio. How are you, Padre? I'm doing fine. How are you? Very well. Glad, glad that you're on the J-O-B today. And uh, we're going <laughs> to be going to get into a couple of questions here in just a moment, uh, including emails. And uh, But mainly, this is a call-in show. So here is our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening outside of North America, please dial the U.S. country code and then 205 271 2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And of course, you can always email us openline at EWTN.com. That's openline at EWTN.com. Be sure to put either Father John in the subject line or apologetics or Monday so that we can get the right question to the right host. So, Father, we have an interesting question here from Jackson, who says, I want to ask about praying novenas novenas for certain intentions, and then your intentions are not realized. Well, how does this relate to being told, ask and you shall receive? I know we are to trust God and trust in His will. Can you help me with understanding this? Thanks, Jackson. Well, that's that's an excellent question, and uh, notice that what it actually says in Scripture is, ask and you shall receive, but it doesn't say ask and you'll receive it. Ah. So there's no there's no guarantee okay. we're going to get exactly what we ask for, but we're going to get something. And Jesus uses this wonderful image. He said, you know, what father would give his son a snake if he asked for an egg? Yeah. Well, what if the kid wanted a scorpion? And the father says, no, it's, that's bad for you. I'm going to give you something better. So uh, that trust, and that's that's like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if possible, let this cup pass, but, and that's that provides at the end of his prayers what we, you and I need to incorporate, and that applies to any novena as well. Not my will, but yours be done. Very good. Here's one uh, for from Stephen. In Scripture, Jesus tells the apostles, go out and get a sword. And then in the garden, Peter pulls a sword. Jesus told him to put it away. What exactly is Jesus <laughs> instructing in this passage? Well, he's not advocating violence in any way, shape, or form. Um, And St. Peter, you know, was a very passionate person, and uh, he also practiced a lot of oral podiatry, putting his foot in his mouth. (laughs) But but, uh, when Jesus talks about taking up the sword, he's talking about defending, uh, defending uh, not necessarily by violence, but defending with the sword of truth and the sword of justice. Uh, defending uh, the truths of our faith, defending innocent life, like when we want to, uh, we're asked to defend the unborn in the womb and defend uh, the sick and dying through, from euthanasia. Uh, so take up the sword is that idea. That's why the sword is a symbol, just like the keys that Jesus gave to, to Peter were a symbol. Okay, very good. And uh, here's an interesting question from Melissa. What is the status of the Dominican Rite, and is it still in use? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, when um, Pope uh, Benedict was was uh, <clears throat> was reigning, uh, uh-huh. he allowed some of the orders who did have their own liturgical uh, rites uh, prior to the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. So uh-huh. the Dominicans were one particular. Um, uh, Order now. I don't think the Franciscans. I know the Franciscans had their own sacramentary, but uh, they didn't have like the Dominicans uh, did things a little bit, a few things differently. Not nothing, obviously nothing illicit and certainly nothing invalid. This was with papal approval. And then after the council, it sort of slipped into you know uh, non-usage. Mm. And then when uh, 
Ecclesia Dei and Sum Pontificum uh, came out, then that was restored. So right now, I'm not sure of the exact status uh, of that, because this is different from the celebration of the extraordinary form at the parish level uh, that was treated in the recent papal document. So uh, this is something that you know, you'd have to ask a Dominican. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, we'll have to hold that one over for uh, Father Brian Milady on Thursday. He would know. <laughs> he would indeed. All right, yes. and he, here's a question uh, from Carol. The Church teaches about abortion, NFP, and contraception, but we don't hear much about what happens to babies that are lost to miscarriages in the first trimester or require a D and C. Is the Church opposed to such a procedure? It's not opposed to a D and C as long as the egg has not been fertilized. Uh, once there's fertilization, that's conception, and that's a human being. Ah. So, uh, so the practice of having a D and C, say after uh, a woman's been raped, uh, they have to do that uh, with a reason, very reasonable amount of time, uh, where they believe that conception has not taken place. Okay. So they remove the egg before it's fertilized. Um, the uh, an ovulant that's a, a medication they can give uh, in those cases uh -huh. that again prevents the egg from being fertilized. But when it when it ejects the already fertilized egg, that's uh, an embryo, and that's what we call an abortifacient, and that's never permitted. All right, very good, Carol. Thanks for your question. Here's one now from John. Father, could you please give some explanation that women should remain silent? It's a hurdle. It's a hurdle in my journey in Christianity, specifically 1 Timothy 2.12. Thank you, John. What do you think? Yes. Uh, listen, I'm not married, but I, I work with a lot of women, and I know that this is a dangerous area. Uh, St. Paul is not talking about uh, common day-to-day -day life, and it certainly is not giving any credence to what's being done in some countries under Sharia law, yeah. where women are not allowed to speak at all. When he's talking about silence, he's talking about in terms of, of uh, ecclesiastical authority, because uh, only baptized males can be ordained. And so to have real jurisdiction in the church, and this goes back to the time of the apostles, and this is something that is shared uh, not only in the Catholic Church, but also in the Eastern Orthodox Church, only ordained men have that jurisdictional canonical authority and in those cases, only the bishop, the priest, or the deacon uh, can, in a sense, speak up. But that's where it—that's where it's only restricted in terms of, you know, having uh, women on the parish council, the finance committee. That certainly is allowed and it's encouraged. Uh -huh. uh, having women, you know, give uh, advice, uh, giving some counsel. That's certainly allowed. In fact, Pope Francis uh, appointed, I believe, a, a, a nun to one of the highest uh, levels at the Vatican, but. It's an advisory thing, and so when he talks about women should be silent, it's very restricted, and you have to understand it in that context. Okay, very good. John, thanks so much for your question. Hope that uh, helps you out. It's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Lines are open for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Our call screener, Matt, will get you uh, screened as quickly as possible. Here's one now, Father, from Michelle. How are we to understand when the Pope speaks ex cathedra versus his own personal opinion? That's a very good question. And ex cathedra, which means from the chair, uh -huh. uh, that's when the, the Pope is infallible. When he speaks ex cathedra on faith and morals, he must intend that this be a, a teaching that's binding in conscience on all the Catholics around the world. And it's only happened on two occasions with the Immaculate Conception that was defined by Pope Pius the, the, the Ninth uh, in uh, 1850, I believe it was, and then uh, under um, Pope Pius the Twelfth with the Assumption of Mary in 1950, um, excuse me, I think it was 19, 1854 was the Immaculate Conception, and uh -huh. then 1950 was the Assumption. Okay. Those are the only two instances of ex cathedra papal statements. Wow. Um, now, it's true, though, the Pope has ordinary infallibility when he reiterates something that has been consistently taught by his predecessors and by all the bishops united with him. But his prudential judgments, his own opinions, which have full juridical weight, we have to obey them, 
We don't have to give them the ascent of faith, however. So uh, not everything the Pope says is infallible, but he certainly has his primacy. All right, very good. And finally, we'll uh, get to this question here from Thomas, and it's a a very profound one. Why did Jesus have to die for us? He had to die because it was to undo the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and uh, through their disobedience came death, and through Jesus, death then becomes uh, the pay, the payment, the, the ransom, uh, because we became sort of slaves of, of the devil. We could not get to heaven. So Jesus freely, willingly gave up his life, and that allowed us the possibility of salvation. All right, Thomas, thanks so much for your email, and uh, we'll get to some more emails in the program uh, if we're allowed to, as in, you know, the clock. But right now, we're going to get to the phones in just a couple of minutes here at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986 for open line. EWTN uses the power of radio to reach people whenever and wherever they're searching for answers to questions about their Catholic faith. EWTN radio is heard on over 500 domestic and international AM and FM radio affiliates. For a complete list of programs and how to hear EWTN radio, visit EWTN.com and click radio. EWTN, the global Catholic network. Father Benedict Groeschel. There are legitimate differences of opinion in any religion. There are differences of opinion in Catholicism. But in Catholicism, you expect that people will take the teaching of its supreme authority seriously. To go diametrically opposed to those teachings is to not be a Catholic. Someone in the name of Catholicism is sponsoring the destruction of human life lives of unborn children. And they got the name Catholic on the door. The highest authority in Catholicism in the encyclical Humanae Vitae, Evangelium Vitae, is absolutely clear that no Catholic can support abortion and that Catholics are responsible to take serious action against legalized abortion. EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. All right, your phone calls are straight ahead here on EWTN's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. That number again, and it looks like we have three lines open at the moment, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. One of the great divisions of EWTN is the Catholic News Agency, CNA. And you can rely on CNA to cover the mission and activities of the Catholic Church, including social, political, moral, and cultural issues from a perspective of faith. For the latest news, if Catholic news that is, visit catholicnewsagency.com, an online service from EWTN News. And right now you can get timely news updates directly to your email inbox. Just visit EWTN.com and click on subscribe and you are good to go. All right, if you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. Here is Tony in Aubrey, Texas, listening on the Great Guadalupe Radio. Hey, Tony, what's on your mind today, sir? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, the 25th, the birth of Christ, uh, I, had a, I have a non-believer at work that uh, brought it up, saying that that's a, basically a pagan day, a holiday. How did the Church come up with the 25th being the birth of Christ? Okay. Uh, that's a very good question, and... Uh, we did not have any uh, strong corroborative evidence in terms of paperwork because only somebody as very powerful and famous like Caesar or even someone like um, uh, King Herod, uh, they would have had records made of exactly when they were born and the location and even the time perhaps. Uh, Jesus you know, lived in obscurity, and there wasn't really a big custom even at his time of annually celebrating your birthday like we do today where a whole lot of cake and sing happy birthday yeah. to you so but there was a custom of 
obviously honoring the, the, the day of his birth because uh, liturgically we celebrated nine months before uh, his conception as mother's womb. Uh, that was the uh, happened at the at the um, um, Annunciation. Uh, that's when the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us on March 25th. So from that, they then deduced, well, if, if they were celebrating this in March, it made sense that nine months later uh, would have been when he was born. But St. Augustine is the one that gives us this most profound insight. He said that when you look at the way the, the world is um, from an agrarian uh, standpoint, which at that time most of the world were people were farmers, um, in December you have the winter solstice where you've got the shortest day of the year. And then at the very next day, the amount of sunlight begins to increase day by day until you've got the summer solstice where you've got the longest day, and then the daylight begins to shrink. Yeah. We celebrate the birth of John the Baptist in summer. We celebrate the birth of Jesus in December. John the Baptist says, I must decrease, he must increase. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. So using those biblical passages, it made sense to celebrate Jesus' birthday uh, when the light began to increase. And it's true, the Romans did have uh, a, a pagan holiday of the, uh, the conquering sun, but the, the, the Christians did not you know, re reinvent anything. They just used the, the fact that people were celebrating and they had their proper celebration. Uh, just like today, you've got people who not only celebrate uh, Christmas, you've got people who celebrate Hanukkah and all these other uh, holidays. So I don't think it's, it's correct to say that the Christians stole... Uh, a pagan holiday. Okay. Hey, Tony, thank you so much for your question. Hope that's helpful for you. For you. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. Three lines open at 833-288-3986. Matthew is watching us on YouTube this afternoon, Father. Matthew says, please, could you explain who Phoebe is at the end of Romans? She is described as a deaconess. I have heard this term mm. used in defense of women's priestly ordination before. Yeah. Any, any thoughts there, Father? <laughs> I heard that when I was in the seminary, <laughs> yeah? and, which was way, way back in the Dark Ages. And there is no uh, credible evidence that she was uh, ordained uh, a deaconess. The term that was used, the deaconess, was one of, uh, of assistance, because in the ancient church, uh -huh. adults were baptized by full immersion, and very typically, I mean, it happens today, if somebody is completely clothed, and especially they're going to be wearing like uh, uh, baptismal garments, which yeah. is almost like a, you know, a smock, well, when it gets wet, it clings to the flesh. So for modesty's sake, they would have a woman who was designated as a deaconess to help with the uh, immersion baptism of adult women, uh, and that way the men would have custody of the eyes. Okay. That's all they did. They didn't preach. They didn't help at the altar. They were not ordained. So Phoebe, her title of deaconess uh, is one, uh, one of analogy and not sacrament. Well, that clears that up. Thank you, uh, Matthew, for uh, watching us today on YouTube. It's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregelio. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Father John, 833 833- 288-3986. Here now, Tito in Houston, listening on the great Guadalupe Radio. Hey, Tito, what's on your mind today? Hi, guys. My, my question is, uh, Germany and Spain, they have a leader of the entire church called the primate, but the United States does not have one. Why is that? Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, primate is merely an honorary title. The primate has no more authority than uh, the other uh, bishops, so it's not the same as would be in, in a political situation. It's a title of honor, and, and um, by extension, the Archbishop of Baltimore, because Baltimore was the first diocese that was founded here in the United States, so the uh, Archbishop of Baltimore, it's now uh, Archbishop William Laurie, he is sometimes called uh, the unofficial primate of the United States, but uh, he doesn't have any more authority than uh, the Archbishop of, of uh, Philadelphia or New York or Los Angeles. Uh -huh. uh, it's an honorary uh, title. But in other countries, especially in Catholic countries, the primate would often have the right to veto uh, names suggested for bishops. Uh -huh. uh, he would also be the one to rep uh, represent the church to the, uh, to the king or monarch uh, before you had f uh, now diplomatic corps of nuncios and apostolic delegates. 
Fascinating. Tito, thanks so much uh, for your question. Erin has a question. She says, I grew up Protestant. Now I'm in the RCIA program. Will you please explain the church's teaching on purgatory? How do we know it exists? Well, we know it exists because in the book of Maccabees, which was part of the Christian Bible for 1,500 years, uh, those seven books that Martin Luther pulled out were there, going back to St. Jerome himself, who Pope Damasus uh, had commissioned him at the end of the 4th century to translate the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. So from the time of, of St. Jerome all the way through the Gutenberg Bible, which everyone's fam- uh, familiar with, yeah. you had those seven extra books, which we call Deuterocanonical, and in the book of Maccabees, which is part of that, uh, there was this practice, they was mentioning the practice of praying for the dead. Well, you can only pray for the dead if if they're in heaven, they don't need prayers. If they're in hell, their prayers won't be of any help. Hmm. So there must be something between heaven and hell in which a dead person, a soul, needs prayerful uh, assistance. And that's what purgatory is. And it, from the word purgatus, which means to cleanse, it's not punishment like you're gone to jail and then you're going to get paroled. Uh, you, people don't go to hell and then get let out. Purgatory is a state of cleansing, of preparation. And just like today, I just went with Father Briganti the other day to visit somebody in the hospital. We had to wash our hands, we had to wear a mask, we had to follow all the COVID protocols, and that's for health reasons. Well, imagine spiritually, you don't want anything unclean to enter into heaven, so uh, certainly mortal sin keeps you out of heaven, but venial sin also uh, smudges you up, so to speak, and so purgatory cleans you up, spruces you up, so you can walk through those pretty gates uh, as bright as you can be. Yeah, sounds good to me. Aaron, thank you so much for your question. Let's go back to the phones and talk with Art in Covington, Kentucky, listening on the great Sacred Heart Radio. Art, what's on your mind today? Okay, thank you for your, uh, your answers. Uh, have, have the uh, question is about the Vatican too. I was going through the uh, Cincinnati Public Library 10 or 15 years ago, and they were selling books. You know, the ones that they, I guess people weren't reading, they were just making more <laughs> space on their shelves. Uh-huh. And, they, and they, I spotted a book by a priest, and um, he mentioned, it, part of his book said that they didn't understand why Pope John the Twenty Third called the uh, Vatican II. And he said that a lot of the church, the only thing they could think of was maybe the council would come up with the definition for sort of our work that Catholics couldn't do on Sunday. Uh, but uh, so basically, there's, what was the reason that Pope John the Twenty Third called Vatican II, and what are some of the things that came out of it? Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm glad you asked that, because I, I did a 16-episode uh, series on EWTN on the doctrines of Vatican II when I was much, much younger. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, it, one of the things I found fascinating was the— the primary, I mean, the initial reason why St. John the Twenty Third uh, started back in council was that the Code of Canon Law, which uh, had not been revised since 1917, needed to be revised. So before they could redo the, the Canon Law, and before they could work on a new catechism, because the old, the only other catechism they had was a catechism of Council of Trent. So they needed to revise Canon Law. They needed to revise the catechism. So to prepare for those two he convened the Second Vatican Council, and his purpose was to get everybody together to discuss and say what needs to be uh, tweaked, okay? okay? Not they're going to invent any new doctrines or anything like that. And in the midst of those dis- liberations discussions, they talked about a whole variety of issues, mostly pastoral. There is no doctrinal definitions uh, in the, the documents of Vatican II, but you've got the dogmatic constitution of the Church, which is Lumen Gentium, which basically just reiterates what's in Vatican I, Trent, going all the way back to Nicaea. It's just taking the truths of the faith and, and speaking about them in modern terms. Okay. Appreciate your call, Art. Thanks for listening to us on Sacred Heart Radio in Covington. Here's a question now from Naomi. If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will never be forgiven. That's what the quote says. Why is this the unforgivable sin? It's the unforgivable sin because uh, blasphemy is not just being impolite. It's utter contempt for what is holy, especially God himself. And so the blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, which is basically done in in one of two ways, uh, by uh, despair or 
uh, by presumption, because uh, if you believe in your heart of hearts that you can't be forgiven, then you're insulting the Holy Spirit who wants to help you receive uh, forgiveness and mercy. And if you believe that you don't need it, all right, that you can get to heaven on your own, that's the sin of Pelagianism. So that is an insult to the Holy Spirit. So those are the two things which we box ourselves into, whereas even something as horrible as murder and other things, uh, those things can be forgiven if the person is truly contrite. Blas blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it's almost, uh, it counts it out, it, it prevents you from being forgiven because you don't want it. Yeah, you don't want to go there. Naomi, thank you so much for your, your question here on EWTN's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Lines are open for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio on EWTN Radio. This is EWTN Catholic Radio. Hi, I'm Doug Keck. This is an EW10 bookmark brief speaking with Benjamin Weicker about the book he co-authored with Scott Hahn entitled The Decline and Fall of Sacred Scripture, How the Bible Became a Secular Book. Why is this so important for the average layperson to understand about this concept? Well, what we have right now, if you go to almost any graduate school and study biblical studies, you think, oh, I'm going to study the Bible. I'll be learning about revealed truth. What you actually be learning is uh, 75 different ways that the Bible is actually a book of mythology. And we wrote this book literally as an antidote. If we get to the foundation of those ideas, then we can overturn the difficulties that we're facing in regard to scriptural scholarship. Benjamin Weicker, along with Scott Hahn, the book, The Decline and Fall of Sacred Scripture and How the Bible Became a Secular Book, it's available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. All Things Catholic, check this book out. And this has been an EWTN Bookmark Brief. We hope to see you next time. Want to be notified when EWTN Open Line goes live on Facebook? Follow EWTN Radio's Facebook page and click the bell icon to be notified. I do listen, and I love EWTN. My mother loved EWTN. It's just a wonderful way, and I thank you for what you're doing, the courage that you have for telling us how it is with Jesus, God, Mary, all of it. We have to get back to something in this country, or we're doomed. EWTN helping people grow in their love and understanding of God. Hi, this is Janet Williams. Please join us for Women of Grace tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern here on EWTN Radio. And now back to Open Line with Father John Tregilio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey, lines are open for you right now for uh, J Father John Tregilio at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Let's go to Jim now in Tampa, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hey, Jim, what's on your mind today? Jim in Tampa, are you there? Jim in Tampa. He got raptured. Uh, apparently so. We're going to put Jim on hold. We will we will come back to him. Let's go uh, instead to this question from Gemma. And we, we had a question about the Holy Spirit a few moments ago. And this one from Gemma says, if you receive the Holy Spirit in your life, is it possible to lose the Holy Spirit? And if so, how do you get him back? Is it by God's grace? And that's uh, that's from Gemma. I would say you are an excellent theologian because uh, mortal sin uh, pushes out the indwelling of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, that's what we get when we're baptized, and anytime we receive the sacraments, we have an increase of what we call sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace makes us holy, makes us a child of God, and the other gift that we get is that uncreated grace, which is God himself. And when we commit a mortal sin, we lose both. We lose the indwelling of the Trinity, which the Holy Spirit is the third person of, and we lose that sanctifying grace, and that's why we then need to go to the sacrament of confession or penance or reconciliation, mm -hmm. which then restores that. So that's how the Holy Spirit is sort of pushed out, but it, along with God the Father and God the Son as well. Gemma, thank you so much for your question. Let's go now to Anne in Detroit, listening on the great Ave Maria Radio. 
Hello, Anne. What's on your mind today? Thank you for taking my call. I wanted to um, a, a different a, a information to provide my provide to my son. Sorry, he's I'm ten years old. He came home from school. Um, they go to church at school, and he was very excited to have brought um, Jesus home with him, which he meant the Eucharist. And he actually didn't tell me right away. He told me later that he said, Mom, I have Jesus in my room. And he was so excited. And I went through a little bit about the monsters at church. We don't leave church with it, but I didn't want to make him upset. I like that he you know, loves Jesus as much. But I need to, I was looking for additional information. I could talk to him a little bit more about this. Uh, how you know we don't not leave church with this? Okay, I and mean, he was again very reverent with it, but um, okay. Any just... any thoughts there, Father? Yes, you certainly want to handle this with with uh, delicacy because you you don't want him to be afraid. You don't want him to feel like you know God's going to throw a lightning bolt at him because he's not. Uh, but you do want to teach him because that's what children need and want. They want to be taught. Teach them with with compassion and charity, but with also enlightened truth that, you know, uh, the the Eucharistic presence, the real presence of Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity must be kept in its proper place, which is in the tabernacle or in the monstrance. And, I mean, it's not the best analogy, but I would say, like, you know, if if the, the mother or your grandmother had these very, you know, valuable jewels that were in the family for generation after generation. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't think Grandma would like would feel comfortable if Junior just took him home, even though she knows he's not going to you know, sell them. But so, well, Grandma, let me take them home because they're so special. Goes, no, no, they belong here with me. <laughs> they right. belong right. in the safe. Yeah. Uh, and so taking care of something that's extremely valuable, and it has nothing to do with the monetary price. It's like when, you know, like when those tornadoes hit in the Midwest, mm. people went to their homes, and what did they look for? Pictures. Sure. You know, things that represented their loved ones, and they treated those things with, with with respect in the same way, you know, when they try to retrieve the bodies of people who were um, you know, killed or injured in these terrible tragedies. Again, it's the idea that it's it's not the monetary value, mm-hmm. it's the, the, the sort of the metaphysical value. So in conveying that to, to the young man and saying, look, I know you, you meant well, but there's a certain proper place where things need to be kept uh, out of respect, and that's how we show our love. In the same way, you wouldn't want to call your mother by her first name, even though she has one. You call her mother because that's your sign of respect. Sure. Okay. Hey, Anne, thank you so much for your call. Let's go again to uh, Jim in Tampa. Hey, Jim, what's on your mind today, sir? Yes. Hey, Father. Um, I appreciate you um, being there to take questions. I was just had a question. Um, you know, I'm, I've been a Catholic all my life and, and, and uh, uh, trying to be devout, and, you know, I'm not a, a radical or anything like that. I mean, I go to the, 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 the noblest order, but a couple of apostolic letters came out, you know, from Rome last last week that uh, where the Pope says he's trying to create unity, but it seems from the Catholic press especially that um, more disunity is, is, is really the result, you know, with him cracking down on further on um, on cloistered religious orders, on the Latin Mass, saying that none of the sacraments can be said in the uh, the former Latin Rite, and um, I, I just don't know, you know, to, how to take take Pope Francis seriously because if, I get the feeling that a lot of people are are not taking him seriously because mm-hmm. they're so dracon they're so draconian and, and just outrageous, and uh, I just I mean I don't want you to. You can take the Fifth Amendment if you want. On this. I don't want you to incriminate you yourself, but, uh, but um, or get or get in trouble with your bishop. But uh, what do you? I mean, do you have any thoughts on this? <laughs> well, yes, and I teach at a seminary, so I have to be very careful. Yeah. Um, um, we make a distinction, as we did a few minutes ago, between what we call prudential judgments of the Roman Pontiff and his um, his papal, infallible teaching, his, uh, the Petrine ministry. So the Pope has jurisdictional power and authority, which is distinct from his teaching authority, and his teaching authority has a special charism to it. Um, his juridical authority certainly is full and supreme, but it, there's no guarantee. 
so that when the Pope appoints a bishop or when he uh, changes canon law, uh, that's not an article of faith. However, it's binding in us in the sense that I have to obey it. I don't have to agree with it or like it, but I have to obey it. Just like when I was growing up, there were things my father told me to do that I didn't necessarily agree with or like, but I did it because he's my dad. And even as an adult, to show respect to him. So as long as we're not commanded to do something that is intrinsically evil or sinful, uh, we have to obey. Uh, the Pope has that authority, but I don't have to internally say, but I think there's a better way, or I like this, or I like that. You can believe that, but we cannot openly attack the Holy Father because you know, the only one who has higher authority in terms of jurisdiction is God himself. That's why a council cannot depose the Pope. Uh, there's no other uh, earthly authority. Um, I know that some secular rulers have thought they so, like Napoleon <laughs> and others. But in terms of us and our relationship with the Pope, yes, we want to make a distinction between um, you know, prudential judgments. However, he is, has the full, fullness of full supreme immediate and, and universal authority. That's different from his uh, magisterial teaching authority. And, we, and, and, and uh, you don't see that happening that often where uh, the papal magisterium uh, is confused with juridical. But I think in the press, we see more of that happening now. All right, Jim, thanks so much uh, for your call. By the way, Jim, you may want to check out the article on uh, the newest from the Vatican that came out over the weekend, and it's you know, it's now at the National Catholic Register's website, ncregister.com. It's an excellent article, ncregister.com. I'm sure you will find it. All right, let's go now to uh, Beth in North Carolina, listening on YouTube. Hello, Beth, what's on your mind today? Hello. Hi, Father. Thanks for taking my question. Um, my husband passed away two week, about two and a half weeks ago, oh. and... Um, he, thank you so much. He had been ill and he had the anointing of the sick. And, um, then a few minutes before he even passed, I had prayed the divine, the chapel of the divine mercy over him. And, um, I'm a convert. I do understand the concept. You know, I do understand, you know, that a purgatory, but mm -hmm. how, when can a person go directly to heaven? I guess is my question. And that's oh. like, you know, I guess yes. that's where I'm at. You know, like, is he, with, all, with that, is he in purgatory, or is he in heaven, or we will we really know until, you know, we get there, too? Well, we won't have what we call metaphysical certitude till you see him yourself. Um, but, <laughs> excuse me, I firmly believe there are many people who are able to bypass purgatory because they do, as we would say, um, they, they, they did their purgatory on earth. I had a brother who had muscular dystrophy, my brother Michael. He died at the age of 26. He had a very, very tough life. He, buried, he carried a huge cross, and I'm convinced that, you know, when he passed, you know, uh, he, he went straight to heaven. Now, that's not a doctrinal uh, thing I'm talking about. That's what I, my own personal opinion there, okay. prudential judgment. But I think there are a lot of people who, you know, and, and it may not necessarily be they had a whole life of, of penance, but... At towards the end, you know, the, the suffering that many people endure uh, with illness and and loss, and whether it's you know physical, mental, or emotional. So yeah, I think it's it's possible, and it's even probable some people don't need purgatory. The church never said that everyone has to go to purgatory, but purgatory is necessary for those who need it. And so I think some people, um, obviously, the saints that are canonized, we don't make any decision on. Did they go to purgatory first? But once the Pope declares them a saint, we're firmly convinced that at that moment they're in heaven. So I think, you know, you, and that's why it's so important to have Masses celebrated uh, for the dead, because we just don't know. And it's not a waste of time for the priest or for the family to pray for that soul, because even if they are in heaven, God's going to take care of that grace and give it to someone who needs it. So you're not wasting his time. I just feel bad that when when people die... Uh, sometimes the priest canonizes them at, at the funeral, yeah. meaning well, but the problem is then that no one's praying for that person, and they may just need some extra prayers to speed things up, and unfortunately people say, well, he doesn't need it. Yeah, well, we don't want that. Beth, uh, again, we are so sorry for your loss, and thank you so much for your call. 
It's uh, Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. If you call right now, we can probably get you on today's show. Our number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Let me tell you about something wonderful coming up on Friday. It's the 48 Hours of Christmas, an EWTN radio tradition. Be sure to join us all day Christmas Eve and all day Christmas Day. 48 hours of special programs, music from around the world. We've got the Mass coming from um, from Rome with the Holy Father. So much more. It's a wonderful tradition of Christmas that we uh, love to bring to you every year. The 48 hours of Christmas starting real early, midnight Eastern, Christmas Eve morning, only on EWTN Radio. Let's go now to Corey and just north of Atlanta, listening on the great Ablaze Radio. Hello, Corey. What's on your mind today? Well, I'm um, Protestant, and I've been listening to y'all's radio station for a while, and I have a, a, I have a couple questions. And, and uh, one of which is based off Romans 3.23. It says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all, it, it, English language, all means all, and that's all all means. Um, so when I say my orchard only produces or uh, we only have, or I, uh, all my apples in my orchard are red, that means every apple in my orchard is red. And so my question goes to, I've been hearing a lot about how, the Pope and how he's um, infallible, and he can make these decisions and rules, and I don't understand Catholicism, I'm a Protestant. But um, my mind goes to, how can, how can, how do you equate, the, or how do you correlate, rather, that, that verse in Romans, with another verse in the Old Testament that says that God gives no man his, his glory. So the standard is the perfection of God, which is means you're God, which means you are part of the Trinity. You are either the, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. Those are the only ones that equal that, or you're man. So I'm trying to understand how you can correlate that to say that the Pope or anybody else, including Mary, could be infallible. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's a legitimate question. First of all, we make a distinction— Infallibility is is the special gift from God that merely means that the Holy Spirit prevents the Holy Father when he intends to teach something that's binding in all the Catholics around the world, that if he's wrong, the Holy Spirit would stop him. That's different from inspiration, where the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, St. Paul, everyone who wrote a book in the Bible. The Holy Spirit guided every single word, every adjective, every noun, every verb, every prepositional phrase. So there's a distinction between inspiration and infallibility, and infallibility merely means it's on a doctrinal level, teaching level. It has nothing to do with impeccability, which is the absence of sin. So we certainly believe, and we have examples of this throughout Church history, that there have been sinful popes, but there's been no pope who's imposed a false teaching, uh, and that's because the Holy Spirit would stop him. And that comes from the mouth of Jesus, who says in Matthew's Gospel, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Whatever you declare bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever. That's that's like your word all. and it's, it's all-encompassing. So he gave the keys of, of authority to the Pope. They came from Jesus, and he says, Upon this rock I, Jesus, will build my church. So it's not the Pope's church, it's Jesus' church, he established it, but he gave the keys, the, the authority, to the Pope, and those keys merely represent uh, his teaching authority and his jurisdictional authority, but in terms of his, he's responsible for any sins he commits, and because of Adam and Eve's sin in Genesis, we're all born in original sin. The only people that were preserved from that uh, was Jesus, obviously, because he's the Son of God, and his mother Mary, because he, pre he preserved her so that she could give him an unstained, uh, a spotless human nature. So all these things come from God, and we want to make those particular distinctions, because sometimes people think, well, if the Pope's infallible, does that mean you know he's perfect? No, it's not. It has nothing to do with morality or spirituality. It's merely on teaching authority, and it's a very restricted um, sense of that. Corey, a great question. Thanks so much for your call. Hope you keep listening to a great station there in Georgia, Ablaze Radio. All right, let's go now to uh, Martin in San Antonio, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Martin, what's on your mind? Uh, yes, I have two very quick questions, and then I'll, uh, I can get off the line. Um, the first one, uh, it's kind of a question about purgatory. Uh, it says when St. Paul is talking, and uh, uh, I believe it's Hebrews, 
he says, we are confident in this and that uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I, I'm just kind of, uh, it feels like a contradictory thing for purgatory. Uh, I, just, I just want more clarity on that. And then um, the second question is also um, about uh, pushing God away from us if we sin. Uh, but in the Hebrews 13, 5, um, the statement is echoed from Deuteronomy 31, 6, which is, uh, I, the Lord, will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, t- two very good questions there. Um, first of all, uh, God never abandons us, but we can abandon him. Certainly that's what Lucifer and all the fallen angels did. Of their own free will, they turned their back on God. When Adam and Eve sinned, okay, they turned their back on God. God, it's correct, God will never leave us, but we can leave him of our own free will, and it's to our own detriment if we do that. But he's always waiting to forgive us. That's, that's the, the good part of it. Now, it's true that when we're uh, apart from the body, when we die, okay, those souls who are in purgatory are with God. They're just not before him face to face. Uh, we, we refer to this as the beatific vision of heaven. So they're, they're in the pipeline. They're, you know, um, I think Father Benedict Rochelle used this analogy uh, that purgatory is like a suburb of heaven. You can hear the, the beautiful music. You can smell the aromas of the fantastic food. You can hear all the laughter and that, but you're just, you didn't get through the doorway yet. Mm. Whereas hell, hell is, is the absence of, of, of God and the people there want that. And that's why they're so miserable. They choose, they want to be separate from God. And because he created us with a free will, he respects that, even when that will goes against him. But the beautiful part is, while we're still alive, we can always repent. You know, that whole idea of the prodigal son, you know, he can change his mind, he can come back while he's alive. After we're dead, it's too late. So the, po- the souls in purgatory are not lost. Uh, they're not uh, out of God's reach. And they are, in a sense, with God but they're not in that full communion yet face to face. That's why there's a distinction between heaven and purgatory, but they're very close. I mean, it's like another analogy I think father used was, um, you know, being stuck on the Lincoln tunnel the day before (laughs) Thanksgiving, you know, you're going to get home. You just don't know when. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Appreciate your call. Thank you so much for it. It is open line Thursday with father John Tregilio here on EWTN radio. Let's go to uh, Barbara now in South Carolina. Barbara, what's on your mind today? Um, thank you, Father. Um, thank you. Uh, what's on my heart and mind today is what can I do and how can I reach a member close to me that has had one or more abortions? Um, when that, it, uh, they um, might close the door on. I don't know what to do outside of prayer to let them know that they can be forgiven, and yeah. uh, I don't think that that person, that this person dear to me, thinks about it. I don't know. Um, they aren't really uh, communicative with me. Just recent, just every now and then, and more, more now, they're more open. But I'm afraid that if I say, "Oh, great, let me put a book," uh, I think there's a book called "Rachel Weep No More." I haven't read it, but it's about this that they will just slam off and get angry and no, you know, and, and, and the door closes. I'm not so much worried mm-hmm. about them closing the door with me because the soul is more important. Um, so I don't know what to do. Okay. Well, I mean, I find myself in that position as well. And Jesus gives us this beautiful uh, image. He says, you know, no prophet without honor except where? In his own house, in his own family. So many times... You know, we're not as successful in evangelizing and enlightening those who are closest to us because they know us too well. They know all our faults, our foibles. They know all the warts and everything on us. So many times, um, the only thing you can do is certainly pray. Pray, uh, give good example. And when the opportunity arises where the person asks you for some advice, where they open the door, then you can walk through it. But you don't want to break into the house, so to speak. And you just busting down the doors, uh, metaphorically speaking, and saying, here's this book, you should read it, it's going to have bad effects. Mm -hmm. But you always, always, always pray for them, 
And uh, when they ask you, then you can go right ahead. But have, again, you have to do like with fraternal correction, you have to do with charity and with discretion. And it, when the topic's brought up, then you have to defend, you know. But again, to do it with, with kindness as opposed to polemically doing it, okay? Sure. There you go. And uh, thank you so much for your call, Barbara. Here is Jasmine now on Long Island listening on YouTube. Jasmine, what's on your mind today? Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, Father Dr. John Trigilio. Um, My question is as follows. Um, actually, I need you to weaponize me. It's about my sister-in-law. I have a sister-in-law that she's going through some some issues, some family problems. So I thought it would be nice for me to give her a statue of a saint that she could um, ask for help and pray to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, my sister-in-law, she just adamantly threw the statue right back at me and told me that she doesn't believe in praying to saints. She doesn't believe in any saints. The only person that she believes in is Jesus and God himself and and occasionally the Blessed Virgin Mary. (laughs) However... And then she says to me, and there's nowhere in the Bible that it says that we should be praying to saints. So I says to her that when Jesus came, Jesus, um, the apostles, he actually turned them into saints for our own good, for us to go to them. They became saints for us to go to them. Um, also, the creed, and our creed, there's a, a, a phrase in there that says in communion, of the saints. So, but can you please elaborate on that? The communion. Okay. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm glad you hit on that because that's, that's the, 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 the ringer right there. What do we mean by communion of saints? It comes from the Latin word communio, which means to be united with. And when you are baptized, you become a child of God, you become part of the family and God's family are all the saints in heaven, the living here on earth and the souls in purgatory. The only people exempt from that are the people who didn't want to belong to the family at all. Those are the people in hell. So, you know, non-Catholics still use the word saint. They talk about St. Peter. They talk about St. Paul. What do they mean by that word saint? Well, that's a holy person who was made holy by God's grace, and they're intercessors for us. There's one mediator, Jesus Christ, between God and man, because he's both human and divine. But many intercessors, and we see them in the gospel, you know, Jairus, we have the Roman centurion. We have all these people who go to Jesus on behalf of someone else. At no point does Jesus say, go away. If they want my help, they can come to me directly. No, he allows people to intercede to him because he's the mediator. They're the intercessors. And that's what basically the saints are doing. They're, they're role models. Uh, they're not superheroes. They don't have no special powers, but they are role models and they're intercessors. And, you know, yeah, we we can go, always go directly to Jesus. No one says you can't, but you can also, like when people get hurt or they have uh, an issue, many non-Catholics, I think it's wonderful, they have what they call prayer chains, where everybody in that parish, in that community, prays for each other. Well, that's intercession, Yeah, you know? Th- that's, that's wonderful. That's, be, that's a community of faith. Well, why, if I can ask a living person for their prayers, why can't I ask a saint in heaven for their prayers? I mean... They're not uh, busy with the wor- concerns of the world anymore, and they would love to pray for us. Absolutely. Jasmine, thank you so much uh, for your call. Father, could you leave us uh, with your blessing, please? Absolutely. Benedica vos omnipotens Deus, Pater, et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father John. And don't forget, tomorrow, Thursday, it's Father Wade Meniz is here on Open Line. Then Wednesday, Father Mitch. Thursday, Father Brian Milady. And, of course, Friday begins the 48 hours of Christmas. On behalf of our fantastic team, including our producer, Michael McCall, I'm Tom Price, along with Father John Tregilio. See you next time here on Open Line. God bless. The EWTN home video highlight for December is the EWTN Family Christmas Special. The 